So, one of the darkest moments in, oh no, darkest, but also most pivotal moments in the Old Testament history is mentioned in the, if the prophets mention it, and it's told about in uh, Chronicles, Kings, but especially Chronicles. It's when the Jewish people went into captivity because they wouldn't listen to God. And God said, you don't want to serve me? I'll show you how tough it is when you serve someone other than me. So the, um, they go into Babylonian captivity, the southern kingdom, for 70 years, as God foretold. And then the Babylonians were conquered by the Persians while this was going on. And then God, to fulfill his word, he's always going to fulfill his word, he arranges for uh, the ruler of the Persian Empire to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I, I want to get the old writings and the prophecies about the, 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 this, this God of the Israelites and all of that. And he gives an order for uh, and permission for a remnant of the people who want to leave where they are. They're all dispersed now. Hardly anyone is living in the land of Israel. It's overrun by animals and, and weeds. So he says, 70 years later. So let's say if you went into captivity when you were a 10-year-old kid, you'd be 80 now. Most of them had died. So now you're settled, you're married, you got a business, and now you can go back and rebuild the temple and the walls of the great God of Israel. Out of all the people who had been dispersed, they only could come up with 50,000. Why? They were settled down. They were making money. Who wants to go back to a depressing situation? Building is hard enough. When you build something, you know, you have land, and there's nothing around, no structures, and you build up into the air. That's hard. Rebuilding is 10 times harder because now you have to deal with cumbersome things and situations and uh, what's happening on, uh, on the ground. So they send 50,000 back. They don't send them. They volunteer to go. And God gives them honor in the Old Testament because they left a comfortable life to build the house of the Lord. All Christians who are serving the Lord and should be serving, we're in another spiritual way. We're all building the temple of God, which is the church. When you pray in a prayer meeting, when you pray for wayward children, when you work with the children, whatever you do, sing, pray, whatever, prayer band, keepers of God's house, whatever you're doing, that's part of being a worker for the Lord. And you're building his temple. He doesn't dwell in buildings. God is not into any buildings. In Jerusalem, in New York, in any place. He's not into buildings anymore. The building is his people, the church. Individually, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. But collectively, around the world, we make up the, the temple of God. The house of God. So, the people go back, this remnant, and the, the leaders are one man named Yeshua, which is Jesus, but the Old Testament name there, and Zerubbabel, who was a leader. And the prophets are prophesying to try to encourage them because when they go back, it's wasted. It's wasted. 70 years, nobody doing anything. No crops, no order, no nothing. The walls are broken down. So... The religious leader in that time, one of the ones who went there and, and tried to get them to honor the Lord and not intermarry with the uh, uh, Canaanite people that were around there was Ezra. That's that small book, uh, Ezra. And then also was Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah came later. And Nehemiah was working for one of the, maybe the head, if I remember correctly, the emperor of the, the king of the Persian Empire, and he, he was serving them. That's right. He was serving them uh, food. And, and he prayed uh, because he was so sad. You know why he was sad? He heard that the walls of Jerusalem had been broken down, never got fixed. And he so identified with his people. Wouldn't it be nice if Christians identified with the church of Jesus Christ and cried and worked and prayed? Not for Democrats or Republicans, but how about Christians? 
because all those other things are going to disappear. Our identity is supposed to be we're Christians. We're going to heaven. How many are planning to go there? Say amen. amen. So this is what we're trying to build up the kingdom of Christ. So, so Nehemiah is very sad. And the governor or the king or whoever he was with goes, what's with you today? I never saw you this sad. He says, how can I be happy? My, my, the, the sacred city is the walls are down. And, and the temple is a mess. It had been broken down, destroyed by the Babylonian army. So the, God gives them favor and he says, go, go there, you can go. And now he orders money to be raised for him. He orders uh, uh, any other Jew who wants to go can go. And now, I mean, um, Nehemiah is like a governor and he's going there to, to encourage the people and, and get the city in shape because there's enemies all around them who are just going to discourage him. So you got to remember this. Here's the lesson. Whenever you go to f do anything for the Lord, enemies will attack you. So I'll repeat that because it's profound. Anytime you want to do anything for the Lord, pray for wayward children, work in a church and not just sit and watch the meeting go by. Anytime you want to get involved, there's going to be an attack. Why? Because Satan wants to fight what you're doing for Jesus Christ. And a lot of people don't want that spiritual warfare, so then they just sit and they fall asleep, which makes Satan even happier. But if you don't want to fight, you can't work for God. At the end of Paul's life, he said, I have fought a good fight right okay it wasn't that good <laughs> so so now let's let's speed read through this one thing just getting to one verse i leave you so we can pray so now nehemiah has gone back and he's analyzed trying to analyze what's going on here he's very wise the hand of the lord was is with him and now he wants to find out what do I do now? The walls are broken down. If the walls are broken down, that means anybody, animals, enemies can come in at night. You have no protection. Walls meant any, everything uh, 2,500 years ago. Walls meant everything. So we read this. When Sanballat, one of the enemies, heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. So Sanballat, by the way, uh, is a type or a figure of the enemies of God, satanic people, wicked people, demonic people. And they'll leave you alone until you get serious about the Lord and then they will attack you. So he became furious. He mocked the Jews. Mocking us is another thing Satan does. He mocked him before his colleagues and the powerful men of Samaria. That's the... This, where the birth of the Samaritans are, and said, what are these pathetic Jews doing? Can they restore it by themselves? Will they offer sacrifice? In other words, here, here, brothers and sisters, listen to me. If you're gonna lay your life for the Lord today and say, God, use me, you're gonna be attacked. If you're gonna get upset by that and say, I don't wanna be attacked, then you're not gonna do anything for God. To be used by God is to be attacked. Jesus was attacked. Jesus was tempted. Paul was battered and bruised. So are you with me or not? So that you have to remember. Then along with attack is mocking. Because <laughs> it's a joke. God can't use you. You're too weak. You're not spiritually strong enough. You're too old. You're too young. You're not educated. Whatever. It's mockery. I went through that early on in the ministry. It was, it was a st strong attack. Like... I don't know how to preach. I'll never learn how to preach. It's a joke. So, will they ever finish it? Can they bring these burnt stones back to life from the mounds of rubble? They're making a mockery of it. Then Tobiah, another piece of work, the Abanite, who was beside him, said, <laughs> "Indeed, even if a fox climbed up, but what they are the, uh, up, what they are building, he would break down their stone wall. The little fox, if a fox ran up, those walls are so weak. What they're doing is pathetic. It's a joke. A, a, a fox would knock it down. This is all for our use here. It's in the Bible to encourage us today. So, listen. This so now Nehemiah is praying. Listen, our God, for we are despised." 
Make their insults return on their own heads and let them be taken as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their guilt or let their sin be erased from your sight because they have angered the builders. He's trying to govern and control the, 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 the construction team. So we rebuilt the wall until the entire wall was joined together up to half its height. For the people, this is another excellent verse, for the people had the will to keep working. God put it in the people to want to work. You want to pray for something tonight for our church? Pray that God will put it in the people's hearts to want to work. Not sit, work. Not just sing, but share the gospel. But God has to do that. You, you can't, you can train, but unless God puts it in someone's heart, they're not going to build because building is hard work. It goes slow. There's enemies. So when Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabs, Ammonites, and Ash, Ashdodites heard that the repair to the walls of Jerusalem was progressing and that the gaps were being closed, they became furious. So this is written for our benefit. When the enemy saw that God was blessing and the people were working, it drove them nuts. That's what satanic forces do. They get crazy when you live for Jesus. When you pray to Jesus, sing for Jesus, work with the children, eh, whatever. Work. The first thing Paul said was when he got converted, when the Lord appeared to him, he said, Lord, what will you have me to do? Not what will you have me to study where vacation, what do you want me to do? So they all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw it into confusion. There we go. Here's another plot of the enemy. When God's people are working, praying, and trying to spread the gospel or, or whatever the thing is that the Lord's put in their heart, he, he not only mocks them, he fights against them, but he tries to bring confusion. He'll send people to bring confusion. There are some people, they have the gift of confusion. When they come, there's going to be confusion. Come on, how many, anybody, haven't you ever met anyone who did just, they bring confusion wherever they go. I Listen, pastors, listen to this. I didn't have a chance to tell you. So one of the son, uh, grandsons of Sister Sorensen, right? Uh, I believe he's going to visit with his wife next year, God willing. He was partnering a church. He and another pastor were co-pastors of a church. Okay, God opened a door and he was going to go away for two months to work uh, in, I think, Europe, someplace over there, Croatia and all that. He went on this trip with his buddy, you know, taking now the, the preaching thing. When he came back, that guy got full of the, himself or the devil or whatever, took the church totally away from him, moved the entire congregation, told him God said to do it. And, and went down two miles down the road and opened up an opposing church. And when my, this, this dear brother came back, there was nothing. There was confusion. The guy lied, said this, that. And when a lot of times when people want to cause confusion, they say the Lord told them. You've met people like that, right? They don't have a clue. They don't know how to spell the word Lord. But the Lord told them, the Lord showed them everything is the Lord. So... So we prayed to our God and stationed a guard because of them day and night. So now they have to build, but they have to defend. In Judah, it was said, the strength of the laborer fails since there's so much rubble. We will never be able to rebuild the wall. They've got sayings to try to discourage them. Hey, the workers are getting tired. It's a bunch of rubble. Nothing's going to come of it. Do I know this like the back of my hand? All those years ago on Atlantic Avenue with three people in the prayer meeting on Tuesday night and an offering of $105 or $85, whatever it was, that, that's all I ever heard in my mind was, nothing's ever going to come of this. What in the world did you leave your job for? And, and take this step. Nothing's going to come of it. So, and our enemy said, they won't realize it until we're among them and we can kill them and stop the work. When the Jews who lived nearby arrived, they said to us time and again to Nehemiah, everywhere you turn, they attack us. So just stop for a second. Do you, do you get the spirit of this story? This is why 
The average church is now down to 68 actual attendees on a Sunday morning. And pastors all around America are getting discouraged because they can't find anyone who wants to do work. They want to sit and criticize and go on social media. But work, pray, build, teach, intercede, disciple. No, 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 I don't have time for that. And if you do start to do that, the enemy comes in. I'm telling you, he just, you could, look, in other words, there was such, Nehemiah was such a tough guy in God because surrounding him was all this discouragement. So when you and I are attacked by discouragement, wake up. It's probably that we're doing something good for God. So, so I stationed people behind the lowest section of the walls, sections of the wall, at the vulnerable areas. He was very smart, Nehemiah. I stationed them by families with their swords, hold that, spears and bows. So he had the families working together because that'll make you fight good when you're fighting with your own family and you're fighting for your family. And now the verse, and then we'll pray. And after I made an inspection, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the great and awe-inspiring Lord and fight for your countrymen, your sons and daughters, your wives and your homes. The Spirit of God came on Nehemiah and Nehemiah had to say something that would make a difference. So here's the three things he wants us, brother, if you play. Here's what he said to them. Don't be afraid. You cannot serve God with fear. For God has not given us a spirit of fear or human trembling or anxiety or worry or insecurity or complexes. I don't care who your parents were. God is stronger than your gene pool. The Holy Spirit is greater than DNA. You cannot be afraid. Are you listening to me? Whatever you're facing today, Satan's going to try to bring fear on you. As they were rebuilding, he tried to get them afraid, backing up, frightened, not sleeping at night. Don't be afraid. How many times did Jesus say this to his disciples? Fear not. I'm with you. If you're here tonight, I'd like to just shake that fear out of you in the name of the Lord. You can't be afraid. I know about some battles with fear. I've had them. We have all had them. But the first thing he told them is, don't be afraid of the enemy because greater is he that's on us and in us than the one, let's clap for that, than the one that's in the world, the enemy. So listen, the enemies are strong. The demonic forces are real and they're strong, but God is greater. The name of Christ is stronger, more powerful. You can't be afraid. If you're bothered by timidity tonight, remember what the New Testament says. God has not given us a spirit of fear. And that was bothering a minister named Timothy, a young uh, convert of Paul. Come on, shake it up, Timothy. God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. Don't be afraid. No, if I try that, it won't work. Stop it. God is with us. So now remember what he said. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of them. Go back. That verse, I needed up there if you could. Don't be afraid of them. Now, remember. Remember the Lord. Yes, he's great and awe-inspiring. When you're facing problems in life, don't be afraid, but remember the Lord. The Lord loves you. The Lord saved you. The Lord is with you. The Lord will never leave you. The Lord is greater living inside of us than anyone out there. Remember the Lord. The enemies want you to get your mind off the Lord and on them and the circumstances. Don't be afraid of them, but remember the Lord. Remember the Lord. All of you here tonight, let's remember the Lord. I know, but Pastor Simba, you know right now, I know it is what it is, but remember the Lord. Come on, is anything too hard for God? Can we say amen to that? Nothing's too hard for God. If we know anything in this church, it's nothing's too hard for God. He has proven himself over and over again. So remember, don't be afraid of them. Say that with me. Don't be afraid of them. 
and whoever the them is, whatever. Don't be afraid of it, them, demonic forces, troublesome people. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of family members who are fighting you because they don't serve God. Remember the Lord. Keep remembering the Lord. There are some things in life to forget. Forgetting those things that are behind. But the Bible is full of verses that say this. Remember this. Remember that. Remember when I helped you. Remember when I took you over the Red Sea. Remember, 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 remember. Remember the Lord. Don't remember your past failures. Don't remember people, what they did to you 20 years ago. Remember the Lord. And then finally, fight. Fight. Having done everything, make sure you're going to stand victorious. No matter what arrows are shot at you, put up the shield of faith. Pray on all occasions. Put on the helmet of salvation. Remember the Lord. Use the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Come on, we got to fight. Come on, brothers and sisters. We got to fight. Don't be afraid of them. Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord and fight. Fight for the Lord from the Lord's side. Fight for your children. Fight for your church in a spiritual sense. And they got the victory. And they rebuilt the temple. And the enemies of God were defeated. And God judged them. And Nehemiah was such a hero. But God is the real hero. But remember this. Don't be afraid. You know, some of you, God's hand is on you, but you're so timid and you're so, I don't know. And I, I know. Listen, and I love you and I understand that. But you can't be afraid. The righteous shall be bold as a lion. Don't be afraid. Not cocky. Not talking smack but strong in the Lord. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Remember the Lord. Satan will try to make all the lights go out so that there's nothing above you, above you except a dark wall, dark ceiling. Remember the Lord. Let his light shine in on you. Go to that word of God every day. Remember the Lord. Oh God, praise God and fight when enemies come don't go I don't know what's going on life is so brothers and sisters the American church is just so notorious for this kind of immaturity and um, victim mentality I you know there's a this devil yeah there's a devil how many have been attacked since you've been a Christian come on attacked attacked what are you going to do? Fight. Resist. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. But to resist the devil, you got to get on your feet and say, no, in the name of the Lord. This is not going to go down this way. The Lord is with me. All oh, those words encouraged me to, this week. Alone in a hotel room. I read that and they jumped up out of me. Up at me and I, I want to share them with you. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. Don't remember what Cousin Tito said about you 11 years ago. Let it go. Let it go. Remember the Lord. Don't remember who's against you. Remember that the Lord is with you. Come on, we've all fallen prey to that. Remember the Lord. Come on, let's stand. Everybody in the building, get out of your seat and come forward. Come on, everybody. I said everybody, they're in the back. Come on. Come on, come on forward. Go in the aisle. Come on. Don't be afraid in the front of the church. Come on. That's it. Just come out in the aisle. We're just going to sing. Come on. Come on, singers. Oh, there. Sorry. I love this word, surely. 
Everybody say surely. 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 Come on, sing. Surely goodness. Surely mercy. Right beside me all my days. And I will dwell in your house forever. Come up out of your seats in the back. Come on, come on, just step out of the aisles. Remember the Lord. Don't be afraid. Fight. Fight in the name of the Lord. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord.
from us. Those who belong to you will not fear. But we will remember the Lord. Your promises. What you've done in the past. Your faithfulness. Your mercy. Your patience. Your great love. The fact that you're full of grace. We will remember that. We will not be afraid. Not of the future, not of the enemy, not of anything. And we will, in the name of the Lord, fight the good fight of faith. We will resist the evil one. We're in a battle, we got it, we understand it, we're not naive. But greater is he that's on our side than the one who's against us. You defeated him on the cross. You rose from the dead. Now work out those victories over and over and over and over and over, over again in our lives. Help us to remember as we dismiss now. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord. Great and awesome. And fight fight not like humans fight not like the flesh fights but in the name of Christ with the full armor of God having done everything no matter what comes against us we will stand in the name of the Lord we will stand the enemy will go down but we will stand because Christ is with us thank you for these beautiful people get us home safely we ask your blessing on the offering in Christ's name. Just listen for one second. This Sunday, I won't have a chance to say that much um, because I, they'll be here and I don't want to go into a lot of details, but nine beautiful people, a bunch of kids and adults are coming from the Gypsy Roma community in Slovakia. Most of them speak English, some don't. You're going to hear a song in Roma that the choir is going to be backing them up with oohs and ahs. This brother who wrote this beautiful Lord's Prayer, but in Roma, the language, so we'll have it on a screen. But they are a persecuted minority everywhere. And now these are Christians, and there's, they're doing great work for the Lord. We want to invest in them, encourage them. So when you see them, you'll see them on Sunday. I don't want to make a big thing about it. Would you try to go out of your way to give them a hug? Give them a hug. Give them an encouraging word. And they'll be here for the next prayer meeting on Tuesday. And um, uh, we're going to have our whole staff here next Tuesday to pray. We're going to have some of the singers here, the choir to pray. We're all going to call on the Lord and, and hear a report among the, uh, the Roma people, okay? Turn around and give someone a high five. Come on, a nice high five. A Christian, that's a low five, a high five. What kind of high five is that?